think it's natural anytime you do something new, right, where you don't have experience, you're going to be scared. It's not just sales. I think any career, you could be a teacher, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, right? Anytime you're practicing a new area, it's going to be intimidating because you don't know what you're doing. And I, I certainly felt that. But I will say, you know, when, when your why is strong enough, you'll always figure out a way how. So I wasn't focusing on my fear when I started in sales. I wasn't focusing on, am I not good enough? Am I qualified to do this job? I was focusing on, I want to get my girlfriend here. I miss her. I need to make this much money. What do I have to do to be successful? And I'm fortunate where I got hired in a company where my first sales manager told me, he made me a guarantee. He said, if you do the things I tell you, you will be successful. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And he said to me, if you do two appointments and you set two appointments every single day, if you do two and if you set two every day, you will make enough money to get your girlfriend here and you will overachieve your quota. And I said, well, how can you guarantee that? He said, I'll, it's simple math. It's simple math. And keep in mind, I was selling copiers at the time. I was not selling software, enterprise software, or something strategic like I am now. I was selling more of a commodity. And he said, it's simple math. If you do two appointments a day, that means you're doing 10 appointments per week. If you're doing 10 appointments a week, that means you're going to find four new opportunities out of those 10 appointments. Out of those 10 initial discovery or initial appointments, four people are going to want to proceed in the sales cycle. They're going to want to see a demo. Or they're going to want to um, get pricing or they're going to want a proposal. Those are called opportunities. And even if you're not a good sales rep, even if you're brand new and you're bad at selling because you don't know what you're doing, one of those four opportunities will close, right? If you're good, then you know 50% or more will close. But if you're really bad, 25%. And one of those deals will go with you. One of those deals will buy from a competitor. One of these deals will, will uh, push into the next month. And one of those deals simply won't do anything. They won't take any action. And so those are just simple numbers. So it all starts with doing two every day and setting two every day. And I think a lot of times we'll get away with that. We'll get away from that. We'll get in our heads. But the reality is when you're meeting with 10 people every day, you're getting practice a lot. You're getting a lot of repetition, talking to people, doing discovery sessions, doing presentations, putting together proposals, handling objections, everything you need to do to get good in sales, you're going to be doing directly during those meetings. And so very quickly, I went on this fast track to learning and growing how to sell. And by, again, by the end of that first year, I was actually very comfortable and I, and I got pretty darn good um, because I did a lot of repetition and a lot of practice. And when, you, when you're in that many deals, you're gonna see every kind of objection, you're gonna hear everything and you're gonna start to know how to respond pretty quickly. So for me, um, I wouldn't say, and this goes for anyone in life, you know, don't let your fear stop you from taking action, right? Because the, the thing you have to be afraid of is your fear, not the act activity. Once you actually like start doing something, you're like, man, why was I so afraid to do that? I should have just started a long time ago. So that's kind of my philosophy is like anytime um, you do something new, it's going to be hard in the beginning, but you just have to do it. And then you realize, you know what, it wasn't that bad. And, and frankly, there's a lot of growth that occurs in doing those new things. And growth is very fulfilling. Growth feels good as a human being. So you're going to feel better by trying the things that you're scared of. It's interesting because there's an old phrase and it comes from Tony Robbins, which I really like. And it says, change occurs when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. In other words, if you're in pain, if what you're doing is not getting you the results you want, if you've been trying on your own and missing your quota or working 80 hours a week only to barely make a plan or just scraping by and you're not happy and you've been trying things on your own and you're not getting the results, then you know it's time. It takes humility. It takes saying, maybe I don't have all the answers. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. And the ego, the ego in our nature is to want to figure it ourselves. We want to be independent. We want to, you know, figure it out and not have to ask for help, especially men. <laughs> you know, I've seen that a lot in the guys I coach. It's just really like, yeah, I'm a man. I can do it. You know what? There's nothing wrong with getting help. In fact, I would encourage everybody, and I'm still getting help. I, you mentioned it. I, I invested 
over $50,000 in my own education. I got a mentor, I got a coach, I joined a sales training mastermind program. It's great you're doing what you're doing, right? People are investing in their own development as a professional and as a person. And so I would just say the time to get help and to get coaching or training or online courses or whatever it is that you are gonna do is when you realize and you come to terms that you don't have all the answers and you're not happy with where you're at. And for me personally, that happened. I had been over quota, literally, it was like, I think it was, um, I'd been at Rico for 10 years and I hit my quota every year and then I and then I went to Salesforce and I hit it the first year. So 11 years in a row and then I missed it three years in a row with Salesforce. And in my entire identity, my entire belief was that I'm only as good as my number. I'm only as good as my performance. I was very proud and public about how great I was. I was the number one guy at Rico. And then I come to Salesforce and I'm just a, a small fish in a big pond. And yes, I had a good first year, but then when I missed it three years in a row, I was so down on myself. I was so, you know, feeling my self-esteem was so low because this was my whole identity, this top performer. And, and you know, the first year I was like, okay, that was, a, that was a whammy. The second year I'm like, man, okay, maybe it's my boss. Maybe it's, you know, the territory. The third year I'm like, I changed the territory, I changed the boss and I still miss it. I'm like, okay, it's me. And so when you can look in the mirror and, and realize, you know what, it is you, um, that's when it's time and everybody's on a different journey. Maybe some people will never raise their hand and, and get help um, in, in terms of selling, uh, coaching, training, whatever. But for me, I, I just felt so depressed and down in that moment that I missed my quota for the year and I missed, missed it by one deal, just one deal. And I remember my head was pounding and I just felt just my ears were ringing and it was the last day of the fiscal year and I thought I was getting the deal and it didn't close. And I, I just said, I never want to feel this again. And since that time, I've hit my quota for four consecutive years, including finishing number one at Salesforce in the Enterprise Select Division and finishing top five. So I've had incredible, and my income has tripled. My income has tripled in that time. So I'm a big advocate for training and coaching. That's why I do my videos. That's why I'm on LinkedIn. That's why I have my side hustles because I want people to experience what I got to experience firsthand and learning how to sell the right way versus you know what I was doing back when I was missing my quota trying to figure it out on my own. I think that's another problem. So first first off, yes, it comes down to facing your fears. Sales in life is facing your fears. Second, one of people's fears is they don't know enough about the technology. Okay? And I carry 50 products, more than 50 products. I carry MuleSoft which is a very technical API management platform. I carry Tableau, which is a very technical visualization problem. I carry Sales Cloud, which is all about Salesforce automation. I carry Service Cloud, which is about case management and opportunity management. If I knew everything about every product, I would never leave my office for the next 30 years. And I'm not kidding. That would be a whole career trying to know my products, okay? And, and what you get is people in sales that think they have to know everything about the products. I'll tell you something. Customers don't care about your product. I'm gonna repeat that again. Customers do not care about your product. What they care about is their business and how are you gonna help them succeed in their business. So no, you don't need to know about the products. You need to know what the products can do for a business. You need to know how customers are using the product to better their business. You're gonna to need to know what customer results have been achieved by other customers who you are working with. That's what customers care about. They care about the problems they have, how you solve those problems, and that other customers have solved it before you. And if you can spend all your training and time learning that versus the technical speeds and feeds, you'll be fine. Most software companies have the position of a solutions engineer that sits alongside, a sale, especially in technical sales, especially, all of them do. I don't know any that don't. And those particular companies that have solutions engineers, the job of the solutions engineer or sales engineer, it's sometimes called, is to basically be the technical arm for the account executive that can answer the technical questions to make sure they understand the product and what it can do to show the product, right? So that's not the job of the account executive. The job of the account executive is to find, advance, and close opportunities. And if we just kind of 
you know, separate those two and leverage and lean on your team. Again, back to quarterbacking, know what your team members do and bring them in to do their jobs. Then I think, um, I, I don't know most things about most products. I really don't. I know what the products can do to the customer. I know what to listen for. You know, when I hear problems, I know what team to bring in. I know enough to be dangerous, but you don't need to be a product expert, especially if you work for a company that might have a lot of products like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft or Salesforce or IBM or, you know, one of these more conglomerate type of, of um, tech companies. If you have one product, yeah, you should probably know it pretty well, right? Because that's all you have. So, but if you have a big bag, like I do, you can't. You can't know everything. You just need to know how to help clients. And I think you don't want to. I think you lose clients when you're talking about the speeds and feeds. Again, clients don't care what your product does. They care what it can do for them. Mm -hmm.